When you start living with the end in mind, everything starts to change. What are people going to say about you? What message is your life going to speak when you're long gone? Because you weren't born by accident. You didn't just happen to be where you're at and happen to watch this video. There is always a reason. Hey guys, I just want to welcome you to the Fuse Life podcast, episode number 39. As you know, Fuse Life, we're all about the abundant life, God-given purpose, and walking in divine destiny. So today, my guest has an amazing story, and um, he's walking in something that's not common, and he's also a father in our nation, so I'm really, really excited to introduce our guest, Papa Norm. Thank you so much for joining us today. Kia ora, Joseph. It's so good to be here. Uh, God bless everybody. Back in the old Aotearoa. Yeah. So maybe you can tell everybody where you are right now and what you're celebrating. Sure, sure. So uh, kia ora whanau. Uh, I'm in Adelaide with Jess right now. And uh, we're, uh, we've never been to Adelaide before. But we're celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. And that was on the 3rd of January, the 3rd of February this year. We were 40 years married. And also on the 9th of December, just a few days ago, was our 40th anniversary of when we gave our lives to Jesus. We know it was the wow. 9th because we wrote it down on this little sort of track thing. So it's a double bang. It's a double crossover. So we're here celebrating for uh, five days in Adelaide. Then we're sail uh, training across to Melbourne. Then we're doing a six-day cruise on the Queen Elizabeth, just celebrating God's goodness in our lives. Wow, living okay. the life. So I just want to congratulate you 40 years. That's a massive milestone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's so awesome to see good examples such as yourself for, for us, you know. So, wow. yeah. And well, also, thank you for taking time out in your holiday to do this. <laughs> no, you're welcome. It, it, wasn't, it nearly wasn't 40 years. Well, uh, 10 months after we were married, in fact, on, my, on our wedding night, I was... Let me see. Um, I was a bit like the gathering demoniac. I had a lot of, I had a different personalities, and uh, I demanded a divorce on our wedding night. I demanded it on our wedding night. So, if you talk to Jess, she'll say that that was a wedding from hell, and uh, and I look back and it was a wedding from hell. And so, ten months after we got married, uh, that's when we gave our lives to Christ. And before we do, we were going to divorce, and I said to Jess, "Do you believe in God?" She says, "Yeah." I says, I do too. I had an encounter with God, Jesus, a couple of years ago when I was in Sydney. Shall we ask Jesus for help? And if it doesn't work, well, we'll just split. And uh, so she said, yeah. So we both um, got literally got down on our knees and, le uh, and leaned on next to the couch with our hands together and uh, asked Jesus. We just The prayer was basically something like, Jesus, we're stuffed. Can you help us? And um, and that was the first, that was our first We'll be both together, came together, and asked Christ into our life. So that was 40 years ago on the 9th of December, 1979. Wow, wow what a story. Glory to God, man. <laughs> just the grace of Jesus. I mean, it's the grace of God. It's, I, I'm no, yeah, it's God. It's Jesus, and I just honor him for it. Wow. So some people will hear that and won't even believe it, right? So <laughs> could we just talk a little bit about who you were back then and sure. some of your story? And yeah. Oh, so, um, I was born and raised in Omaru, North Otago, which is a, a small Pākehā town. And my mother was part Māori and dad was Pākehā, Ngāti Pākehā. Mum was a generation beaten for speaking Māori, so she never taught us Māori. And we were the, the only Māori kids at school, so I felt inferior. I didn't like being a Māori. I wanted to be the Pākehā kid. So I would rub talcum powder into my face and onto my arms, a Johnson's baby talcum powder, me and my brothers, because we were like Pākehā kids. We did like being called niggers and darkies. And so I grew up with this sort of chip on my shoulder about who I was. Um, I didn't want to be a Māori. Uh, and uh, so that was sort of a bit of an underlying in impetus in my life. Um, I went to Waitaki Boys High School. Uh, great parents. My mum and dad loved me. I never felt I wasn't loved, but I just held this chip. Um, went to Waitaki Boys. I thought I was dumb. Eh? I, I just I couldn't add up past about six times table. Um, I just hated being at school, and I just dreamt about being a Hell's Angel and riding on a, a big Harley with ape hangers and ride down the highway, just stuff the world. I just had this chip on my shoulder, and um, so I left school and um, 
bought a Triumph 500. And uh, within a couple of years, I was riding around the countryside with bikies in New Zealand, getting into trouble always at the police station. And um, wasn't very but that bad, really. It was before the drugs came in. But I rode with uh, people like the Highwaymen, the Epitaph, right, or not, or the uh, uh, Natural Sinners down in Christchurch. It was their name, the Natural Sinners. And uh, they were some good friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's just natural to be a sinner, right? <laughs> it's a great name. <laughs> they used to be called the coffin cheaters. <laughs> so, uh, so, but I, I got into, I wanted to know if there was a God. And um, I remember when I, um, I don't know what it was that turned to, oh, that's right. I would ride through giveaway signs at 90 mile an hour and without looking. And at night, I would lie in bed at night and wonder where I would have gone if I died. Mm. And because I was taught evolution at school that we just come from the apes and we just go to nothing, it really frustrated me. I thought if we go to nothing, it doesn't matter whether you're Mother Teresa or, or, or Adolf Hitler, no one's going to remember. Mm. So why live a good life? I thought, well, how stupid is that? Mm. So uh, this rebellion just stirred up within me. So I, I just gave the finger to the world and to society and to rules in general. Mm. And I um, was very angry. And uh, I, I remember look went to a seance on the west coast with a mate and um, some mates, and they, we, there was a glass on the table and it started moving around and spelt out a message. And I thought, oh, someone's playing games. So I looked under the table, but there's nothing under there. And this thing's this glass is moving by itself. And uh, the guy next to me, he started, he fell off his chair and started talking in a woman's voice. And it was the freakiest thing I've been in. I was only about maybe 19, 20. And um, and that night, when I went home, I, I had this terror, this fear on me. I didn't believe in God or the devil, but it, man, this was this, this eerie feeling on me. And uh, there was a lightning storm that night, and the room lit up with lightning. And there was, I saw these shadows in my room, and I literally froze with fear. And I, I thought, far there, maybe there is a devil. And um, so that connected me to the dark side, and I had this fascination with death. And uh, so I got out of the bikey seat. Um, my girlfriend that I was going to get married to, she cheated on me. Um, and, and that just killed me. Um, I was quite a happy-go-lucky young, young, young fella. But when she cheated on me, uh, I did two things. I was going to kill her and the guy. So I was, had this murderous intent that I was just going to do it. I just this rage in me. And, uh, but the other part of it, I was so heartbroken. I didn't want to live anymore as well. And so this went on for a few months where it was murderous or suicide. And uh, I struggled with this. And I thank God now I look back and I think it had to be an angel that stopped me from mm. doing what I did because I was right on the verge, right on the verge. It was just, there was no rationale. It was just consuming rage and sorrow. So um, I bought a one-way ticket and I went to South Australia and I, Worked in the RNH, uh, BHP mine in um, South Australia, actually, Wyala. Worked there for six months. Tried to get my stuff together. Got crying drunk every night. And I used to shake my fist at the sky. And I used to say, if there's a God up there, I hate your guts. Because I didn't know if there was a God, but I blamed somebody. I didn't blame God. I said, because mm. in, my, in my pain, I would cry out, if there's a God, help me. Help mm. me. Mm. And... And, uh, but I wasn't open for help. I just helped me do something. And I'll never forget that. Back in 1975, shaking my fist at the sky. Mm. And I think back now, and I, I, I hear God say, look, son, I was trying to reach down. I was trying to help you. But you're like one of those little chihuahua dogs. <laughs> I try to touch you, and you want to bite me? <laughs> and, so I, and I was. I was just so angry. But it was two years later. Um, and I was still carrying this depression uh, that's diagnosed as manic depression. So I actually had it for 13 years as a result of this, this um, breakup. Um, so it was two years later, 77, I was in uh, Sydney, Australia. And my best friend, his name's Tony. He's from Thessalonica. He's a Greek guy. And um, he had Thessalonica tattooed across his stomach. That's why I knew he came from Thessalonica. Mm. And I said, what's that mean? He said, oh, it's a Bible town. He says, you know, Jesus is coming back one day and the world's going to end. 
I says, really? Isn't that fairy tales? He says, no, it's truth, but I, I don't want to be a Christian. <laughs> he said, so he was pushing heroin, and he had a high-class prostitute working for him at the cross, and she would bring between eight to uh, $600 a night. That was back in the 70s. He also, yeah, just a terrible man, but my best friend. Mm. And I was heavily into martial arts then, and I was training to be a professional fighter in uh, Sydney, and then I was going to go to America and be a pro fighter. So my goal was to be middleweight world champ by 27. And so my whole life consisted now out of the gang scene, still taking drugs, but I had a purpose in life, and that was to be a world champ by 27. Hey guys, I just want to take a quick minute to tell you about our Royal Hybrids group coaching program. Over a year ago, the Lord started speaking to me about a group of people, a tribe that would only get their value, their affirmation, that would only get their identity from who they are in God and nothing else. And from that place, they were going to do great things on the earth. In the last year, we have seen a whole bunch of people jump into our program, solidify themselves in their identity with God, and from that place, actually start to engage their purpose. Fuse Life talks about the six trees, your spirit, your soul, your body, and then your relationships, your finances, and your purpose. We have seen a whole bunch of people come through this, get solidified in who they are, and then begin their own projects, whether it's a teen mums project, whether it's a coaching counseling business, or a painting business, publishing your children's book, publishing a puzzle book. We have seen people do all of these kind of things and we just know that this is just the beginning. So you want to go to www.fusebornformore.com forward slash royal hybrids or just click the link in the caption and make sure to check out what we are doing. We would love to have you as part of our tribe. Now back to the podcast. My mate, he kept taking acid and giving it to me, and we would go on drug deals, and I was his minder, so I would be there to protect him, and he would reward me with drugs and parties and hire cars. And uh, slowly, though, this guy, he went started going crazy, literally crazy. Um, one night, uh, one day, he tried to strangle his prostitute, tried to kill her. He's driving the car, and he just stopped the car on the main street, climbed in the back, he's just strangling her. So I had to pull him off and slap him out of it, and he's frothing at the mouth. I said, what's wrong with you, mate? And he just couldn't talk properly. And so little by little over the months he did, or weeks, he started spiraling out of control until one day I knocked on his door. He lived in Vaucluse in Sydney, which is a, a posh suburb. He lived in a house up like Disneyland. It was all lit up at night. It was amazing. So I, I went to visit him one day, and he's gone. The furniture's gone. So I assumed he got busted and he's in jail. Um, I tracked him down about a month later, and uh, he was living in the cross in a little flat, him, his uh, prostitute, and his wife. And when I finally opened the door, he invited me in. I had a big bottle of Jim Beam and a big bag of, uh, of marijuana in one hand. I says, at last, let's party. Where have you been, my friend? Mm. He said, um, we don't need that anymore, Norm. We found Jesus. <laughs> That's what he said. And I thought he was joking. I said, yeah, 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 come, let's, let's party. And he said, no, no. He said, I found Jesus. And he said, I, was, I went mad. And he said, it was because of the lifestyle. And I'm never going back to that. He said, Jesus is real. I called on his name and he put my mind back. He said, I'm never going back. He said, I don't want that. I, I'm, and his wife said, I've never seen Tony so happy in his, my life. So she, became, she turned to Jesus. And the prostitute, she says, I found Jesus too. So the, the whole three of them sitting there beaming. And I thought, wow, what are you on? I want what you've got. I didn't know it was Jesus. I thought it was a drug they were on. So he mm. told me, Jesus is real norm. And because he's my mate, he's my best friend, he would never lie to me. I'd never lie to him. I knew, far, he must be real. Because no one could change my friend. So it was at that point, he, he didn't preach to me. Oh, he's a good mate. He just said, bro, We've tried acid, we've tried coke, we've tried this. You should try Jesus. Mm. He's amazing. I said, nah, I like my drug sex, rock and roll. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to go to hell, though. If there's a hell, I, don't, I know that's where I'm going, but I, I want to go to heaven. But when I'm old and I'm a nice person, I'll probably become a Christian then. <laughs> mm. He said, uh, it's not about that, Norm. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And, you know, I don't know what he's talking about. So he, him and... 
he left town. He, he had to get out of a, his old environment. So he said to me before he left, one day in your, de- in your darkest moment, Norm, you're going to need to call on the name of the Lord. I said, yeah, well, whatever. And, um, and I forgot about that. And so he left. He went to Melbourne. I stayed in Sydney. Um, it was only about probably any weeks later that I was, uh, well, I was having, I was, uh, I was smoking some hash out of a water bong, you know, and it, I was sucking it up. And the the hash had um, the mafia had put um, horse strychnine in it because it was bad hash, it had no kick. So they they would do this from time to time, put strychnine in it, and it makes the the horse's heart beat strong. But so it gives it a bit of a kick. Mm. But I was born with a heart murmur when I was a kid, when I was a baby. And um, I didn't realize there was anything in the hash. So when I sucked it in, it went straight into my bloodstream. Then my heart went crazy. And uh, there's a whole room full of it. We all OD'd. We all overdosed. But I was the worst. I fell off my seat. I crawled out into the, into the grass outside the house. And I just lay with my face in the grass. It was, not, it, was, it was midnight. And I remember just lying there, my face down, and my head wouldn't stop spinning. I kept vomiting. And then my whole left, uh, right side became paralyzed, and then my left side. I couldn't even move my eyelids. I was just frozen, paralyzed, lying in my own vomit. And I realized that my face is down and that the vomit's rising, and it's covering my mouth. So I had to breathe through my nostrils. And as I kept vomiting, it covered the first nostril, and I I can't move. And it was at that point that I realized I'm going to die, I'm going to drown in my own vomit. And um, fire, it was surreal, Joseph. I mean, I was, I was angry. I thought, I don't want to die like this. My mates have died like that, some of them. And I thought, how could I die like this? I, there's no way I was going to die like that. I thought, that's for losers. But here I am now. As I'm lying there face down, this is in Bondi Beach, um, I felt somebody stand next to me, like some feet standing next to me. So in my mind, I was willing them to help me, turn me over. Can't you see? Help me. And this, this laughter came. I heard it laugh, and it says, it just laughed at me, so I've got you now. I've got you now. And it was the most evil feeling person. I've, and I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God or the devil, but there's this evil thing. I've got you now. So I, I realized that I'm going to go to hell where I deserve to go because I knew the life I lived. I didn't go, deserve to go to heaven. It was at that point, thank God, my mate's words, they sort of came into my mind call on the name of Jesus. That's all it was, call on the name of Jesus. And um, so I never prayed in my life. I mean, how do you pray? My mouth's under my vomit. I can't pray. I don't know what to do. So all I could do is just think, help. I just thought, thought, help me, Jesus. Jesus, help me. That's right. Three words, Jesus, help me. And um, the moment I just thought those words, literally my head stopped spinning and this peace came on me. And I was still paralyzed but I wasn't vomiting, so I knew that wouldn't rise anymore. And I just lay there until this whole perilous wore off. About I don't know, it might have been half an hour, an hour. I don't know. It seemed like ages. And so when I sat up, I'll never forget. I mean, literally to this day, the, I had long hair down to here then. And uh, I remember pulling the carrots and the chunder out of my oh, – I stunk like a – I was thinking, how will I get a taxi back? No one will pick me up. Like I stink so much, but I'm alive and God – it's real. So that was my first encounter with Jesus, and well, the devil and Jesus. And um, so, so when I said to Jess, "Do you believe in Jesus?" That was uh, it was three years later, two years later. It was on the basis of the encounter I had when I nearly died, and um, I didn't follow Jesus straight away. I, I, I believed he was real now, and um, whenever I'd get stoned. I would be lying there and I'd say, Jesus, don't let me die tonight. Don't let me overdose. Please look after me. And I will give my life to you next month. And I kept saying, I will give my life to you next month. Because there's something in me told me, you need to live for him. And and I knew, I, I do. Because I felt peace and happiness too. When he touched me, I never felt happiness like it. Better than any stone I've ever had. And I thought, man, I want this. But I had this insecurity. You know, I'm a little blimmin' darky. I've I'm, I'm got this chip on my shoulder, um, angry at society, angry at I don't like myself. And um, so I had this image I had to live up to, this tough guy image, this macho man. Mm. 
and um, this lack of identity, the lack of knowing who I am. Mm. So, this is crazy because, firstly, I don't think people realize how real the racism was. Like the way you're saying it to me, I didn't even know. For mo- like, I, I'm an Indian. When I came here, I faced a lot of racism. In '97, yeah. it was real, you know. Um, I got baited into fights. I got spared ass, and wow. I I subtly became a racist towards white people sure. without sure. realizing, you know. But what you're saying about putting the powder in it, man, that must uh-huh. have been really real. Like, yeah, me and my brother, me and Ross, my older brother, he is paler than us. He didn't need the powder. It was just me and my bro- my uh, younger brother we were the duckies. Yeah, Ross was even darker than me. But what was but, happening to make you feel that? Like, what were people well, doing? Or they're just kids at school, just saying, you know, nigger, darky. Uh, I remember when I was even a baby being pushed in a pram, I remember a man came up to my mother and called her a black bitch. And uh, I'll never forget that. And I said to my auntie, why did that man call my mum that? And, um, and that, that's way back, must have been in the 60s. I was in a pram. And, um, I mean, it wasn't overt. It was sort of, it wasn't sort of in your face. It was just an innuendo. And I think a lot of it was with me. It was my perception. And um, I felt like people were uh, putting us down. And I got that sort of uh, chip on my shoulder attitude. And, um, and maybe some people weren't, but I, I, I carried that. Mm. And, um, but it, it went, I'll never forget that that went. It was um, after I had the encounter with God, wasn't following him, but believed in him. So I, I remember I went and bought a Bible. <clears throat> it was called, uh, it was a good news Bible and nice and easy to read with pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I was pretty illiterate. So I liked the pictures and I sat down in uh, Central Park in Sydney and under the old uh, epitaph at the, where the Anzac uh, monument is. I remember sitting there and just reading the Bible to, well, if Jesus is real, well, he is real, I better find out about him. Because I tried to read the Bible years ago, and I got so angry. You know, I read Genesis and uh, the chapter 1, chapter 2, and I thought it was so stupid. I, I remember throwing it across the floor. It was mum's Bible, her little pocket Bible. I would throw it across the floor. Stupid book. And um, so here I am now with a different mindset. And one of the things I learned in doing karate was a Zen, a Zen priest a proverb. And one priest said to the other, how can you taste my tea unless you first empty your cup? Mm. And that thought came to my mind. How can I believe in Jesus if I don't empty by my mind of all my preconceptions, all my theories? So I, I decided I'll read this book as if it's the truth and I'll empty my mind and my preconceptions and I'll just read from, I don't know, you read a book, you read the first chapter, I guess. So Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 2. And when I got to Genesis 3, um, obviously it was the Spirit of God came on me. I just felt, man, God made me. I'm a creation of God. And I looked at the trees and I said, that didn't come out of an explosion. God made that tree. I'm leaning against this tree. And I, mean, I literally looked at the tree and looked at the leaves. And, looked, and it was like, wow, like, aha, one of those wow moments. Mm. But I, it's the Spirit of God. I, mean, I look back now, the Spirit of God was on me. And he said, and I felt he said, I made you. Mm. And I made you the way you are. You're part Moldy, you're part Parkia. And it was at that very second, all this insecurity about who I was, I just suddenly, oh, I belong to you. And um, all that sort of racism, insecurity, it literally left me right there. I've never looked back. And I wasn't even, quote, born again. Mm. I hadn't done the sinner's prayer, hadn't done the whole church thing. In fact, I wasn't even going to, but I. I started going to a church. I thought it was a church, but it was called the Christian Scientists, I think, whatever. <laughs> and they're all full of old, old people. And But I was just so full of this joy that I was like, wow, where's all the young people? <laughs> and so I was reading about Mary uh, Ed, uh, Ed, uh, Baker, Eddie, I think her name was, and she talked about sin is only an, imagine, an illusion. And So I mixed that up with Eastern religion, and I got into my martial when I was doing my martial arts. I tapped into a supernatural spiritual force. Mm. I, I could do 24 rounds and hardly be puffing. Mm. And I thought, this must be God's power, and he's going to let me become world champion, and I'll talk about God help me become world champion. So I was on this sort of buzz that God is giving me power to be the world champion. So I had this sort of 
Mm. Mm. But it was a supernatural power connected to the powers, the demonic stuff that came into me when I was doing the black, you know, the seances and, and all that stuff. Mm. Do you do you believe that a martial artist or a a combat fighter like a like a boxer sure. could be um, empowered by God? Like you know, you got Evander Holyfield. Absolutely. He had a, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be Evander, but I saw that. That oh, that was my dream. But, <laughs> but, but it wasn't God's dream for me. It was mm-hmm. my dream for me. Mm-hmm. And um, sure, I believe martial arts i think you know while it's just a physical aspect it's just the same as rugby or tennis it's only a physical activity mm. it's when when we bring in when well when i brought in the spiritual side and began to worship either buddha or some eastern religious god that then it brings out that spiritual content but when it's just simply a physical activity there's it's just no more no more dangerous than playing tennis or rugby so, so- uh, how did yeah. you figure out that this was wrong, and how did you get it out? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, when I became a Christian, I heard so many stories. Everything was evil. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was so willing and wanting to please Jesus that I didn't think I would just burn stuff. I would throw things out. I, would, I mean, my, yeah, I, I threw out some good stuff. My dad was a carver. He carved moldy carvings, but he was Pakia, but he So I burnt all his carvings because I thought they were of the devil. Because mm. anything I was taught anything that was moldy was of the devil. Mm. All martial arts of of the devil. Mm. And, um, and then I began to think about, but I'm not worshiping a lemon god. I'm not worshiping Buddha. I'm just punching a bag. And oh, I, 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 the Lord called me out of fighting people. Because the last time I knocked someone out, it felt so good. But the Lord spoke to me. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and he said, would you like your neighbor doing that to you? And I thought, oh, no. I'd like to do it to my neighbor, but not my And he said, son, I want you to fight for me, but I don't, I don't want you fighting with these anymore. You're going to mm. learn to fight in another, another realm. And that was huge for me because... That was my God. My mm. martial arts was my God. And that, that's when I had to come to the – and God says you can still do it, but you can't follow the spirit that was motivating you. Mm. Lay it down for me. And my love for him, I said, I'll lay it down for you. And when I laid it down, he said, you can take up the physical. There's no harm in doing that. Keep yourself fit, even self-defense, things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. He says, but the God behind it. He said, look, he said, basically, he said, I don't need you. I said, God, but maybe I need my self-defense. I might, it might come in handy. He says, son, I came upon Samson. He took out a thousand men. <laughs> he said, so don't worry about your martial arts. It ain't got to save you. He says, my spirit can come upon you and wipe out a thousand. Mm. So from that point, you know, I, that's why I, I knew that now I'm free. I, I think wow. it's the spirit behind what we do. It's like playing uh, uh, heavy, you know, a guitar with those heavy chords. It's the spirit behind it. It's the spirit mm. of God, the spirit of worship. Uh, my, you know, I love Jesus, and uh, whatever I do, and word or dare do for the glory of God, it's out of my, out of the spirit of God, out of my spirit to His spirit. It's not out of, out of me to a demon spirit, and it's just a bit of common sense, basically. Mm. Wow. So you simplify that because I know some people still, you know, I like that. Uh, yeah. I know. They say, oh, you shouldn't go into a dojo. Yeah. You shouldn't do this. And uh, I, I learned more respect doing martial, doing karate than uh, I've seen a lot of churches teach. Mm. Respect, uh, integrity, uh, discipline. Uh, in fact, it was my sensei who taught me to show a bit of respect. Um, I was just, yeah, out of control. And he just said to me, Norm, show a bit of respect to these people. And because I looked up to him, I realized what a dork I am. And I wasn't a Christian at the time. But, you know, they're, they're this, it's not tossing the baby out with the bathwater, I guess. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so today you travel around the world. You've been teaching people to walk in the miraculous. Wow. Your whole life has flipped. Can we go back to the beginning where this began for you, where you started to partner with God and stuff started sure. happening? Yeah, um, so so me and Jess, we, we got on our knees, turned to Christ, 
and Jesus came in and we went to a church, uh, a Presbyterian church actually, and the minister's name, he was uh, John Ballantyne. He was uh, more Pentecostal than the Pentecostals, and <laughs> um, but he was grounded. He wasn't just all pie in the sky, and he became our spiritual dad basically, and he fathered us, and he showed me how to be a better man, a better husband, a better father, um, and it was just a, just and he still is just an amazing guy, but he also taught me about the spiritual side, and um, I would follow him around and watch him prophesy, watch him pray for the sick. I mean, crazy miracles, even cars that wouldn't start. He would pray over a car, would sit, stand there for a few seconds, then he'd say, turn the key, and, the, and it would go again. It was just really freaky stuff. Um, I saw him casting out demons and uh, healing the sick and winning people to Jesus. And so he said, this is normal Christianity, Norm. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. If this is part of your life, it's not true Christianity. And so I emulated him. And so we, I would begin to prophesy over people and pray for the sick and just just copy what he did. So I was born in the fire of God, so to speak, mm. not the smoke. Mm. And um, that was from a Presbyterian minister, not a Pentecostal, a, Pen a Presbyterian. Wow. And so John became the Elam pastor. He, the the priests didn't like him, so they basically told him to, well, chuck them out. So mm. he started the Elam Church in Omaru, which we, he said, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Mm. And so I said to Jesus, what should I do? He said, you follow the ministry that's going to grow your ministry to mm. fulfill what I called you to be. And so that's why I, I sat under John for tw uh, 12 years. Wow. Um, helped him plant churches in North Otago and, uh, and and just moved in the power of God. Saw the church grow in Omaru to about 200 uh, we go door knocking, did all sorts of stuff, just trying to win anybody to Jesus. Became, I was a freezing worker at the time. I would uh, every Thursday in the car park, I would uh, preach in the car park when all the guys are lined up at the cafeteria to pay their weekly bill. They had nowhere to go, and so <laughs> I would just I would preach to them, but not not preach down to them. I would mm. just talk to them about suicide and why do people commit suicide. I says I wanted to do that because I had no purpose in life, but I found Jesus, mate. And I know you guys, some of you are depressed, some of you are going around the circles, same old, same old. If you need any help, you know who I am, just give us a yell. I found somebody who can help me, his name's Jesus. Thanks, guys. So every Thursday, I would do this little sort of uh, street preach. And, uh, man, I used to freak out, though, because I, I, would, I would be shaking. My knees would be shaking the day before. Oh, no, I've got to preach at the car park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how do we get to Gisborne? And how do we get where we are today? Um, I had a, I was praying in my kitchen and I had a, a out of body experience and um, some called it astral travel, but it wasn't. It was just my body, my spirit left my body. And I was taken up to Gisborne and hovering over the bay, Copperty Bay. I saw the cliffs, young Nick's head, and I saw war canoes in the water. And the Holy Spirit literally shouted at me. He said, you will come to this place and you will raise up a warrior church. Wow. And as he said, said this, I saw people digging themselves out of the dirt. And I saw myself speaking down there and people would dig themselves out of the dirt, like out of the graves, out of the dirt. I don't know. But, and then they would become white with the righteousness of God as they listened to the message. And then they walked on the water and took, play, took their seats in these waka, these walker mm. Probably about, I don't know, maybe 50 waka. And then the voice said, when the time is right, by the wind of my spirit, I will send these walkers into the nation and the nations of the earth. And then they, wow. these walkers begin to move without anyone sailing them. And, uh, and so I'm back in, straight away, I'm back in my own room and I'm room again, just freaking out because this means my whole family to move. Is this God? I, I wasn't, is this God? Mm. So I said, that if this is you, God, you tell my wife. And then you confirm it with my pastor. And I'm not yeah. going to say anything till you do that. And uh, he did within two weeks. Jess said, if God wants us to leave, I'm ready. And so we went to tell our pastor what I saw. And he, John says, uh, before you say anything, I want to tell you, God told me Norma and Jess are going to Gisborne. Mm. And so that was a threefold witness. So that was um, the 14th of January, 1991. We drove into Gisborne. Didn't know a soul there. Um, 
put an ad in the paper, morning and night services at the Harpura School Hall. Uh, if you need help, you, there's someone, I, I know someone, his name is Jesus, come on along. And the first service started on the 28th of April, 1991. We had uh, morning and night services, 67 people turned up. And 12 gave their lives to Jesus. At least nine of them are still on fire for Jesus to this day. Wow. And the church grew from nothing to 504 years, predominantly through signs and wonders, miracles, and, and love. Mm. And love being expressed through counseling that dealt with root issues, counseling that dealt with the, with the, with the violence, and counseling that dealt with the, uh, uh, the marmai, the, the pain. And so when the inward was changed, the outward behaviors changed because through Jesus. And I just taught them what Jesus taught me, me and Jess. And Jess, she was, you know, she helped raise it. The children's work, the children's ministry grew to hundreds. But the signs and wonders, I mean, the first services, uh, a lady got healed of arthritis. Um, uh, a lady got healed of AIDS. That wasn't the first service. That was wow. a few services. She got healed of AIDS, completely cleared. To this day, she walks around Gisborne, completely healed. Uh, a guy jumped out of a wheelchair, motorized wheelchair. Uh, and so these signs and wonders, suddenly people just flocked to church. And that's why it grew so fast. And what my father taught me, my spiritual dad, this is Jesus, the same yesterday, today, forever. Um just a previous to before I went to Gisborne in 19, um, 1989, I, God said, go to India. And he literally did. So I went to India, uh, um, ministered with Stuart Grimance, which is the Jesus Heals campaigns, saw miracles that I only dream about, miracles that I only read about in the Bible, uh, saw the dead come back to life, saw blind eyes open, deaf healed instantaneously, cripples walking. And uh, that was through my prayers. I wow. couldn't believe it. And God says, what you see in Gisborne, or what you've seen in India, you will see in Gisborne. Wow. So I've seen maybe a third of what I've seen in India. I've seen only a third of it in New Zealand, in Gisborne. But he said it's going to hit this nation. Wow. I don't know when, but I'm, 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 I'm positioning myself for that. Yeah. So how many years have you been going now? Uh, we've been in Gisborne uh, 28 years. Wow. We'll be 29 coming uh, January. Wow. So next month. So these are some of this. This is how the church grew. So uh, for instance, um, one guy came to church. His name was Zach. And uh, well, before he came, there's a big guy called Wudamu. He came to church and he walked up the front and he's real. He's ex Maori radical. Well, he's a Maori radical actually at the time. And he says, my life's stuffed. I'm on murder, accepted murder charges and all this stuff. I says, I can't help you, mate, but I know somebody. And his name's Jesus. And if you ask him into your life, he'll help you. He said, oh, well, I've got nothing to lose. <laughs> so he asked Jesus into his life, and he literally fell over under the power of God. I mean, he's a big fellow. No one can catch him. And um, and when he got up, he's just a different man. He just, he just no more racism. He's just full of love, overflowing love. He, God healed his heart, healed him of his mental die of cancer, healed him of that. Today, Wurrimu and Leia are being used by God to turn the whole psychiatry realm upside down. I've started a school called Matakiti, which means seer in Māori. And uh, so Wurrimu is a seer. He's a prophet. He's a Māori prophet. And he, can see, he sees things. He sees things like where blood's been spilt. He sees, he sees demons. He sees people. He sees things in the spirit. And I taught about the gifts of God were given to him before birth. That is nothing mm. evil or wrong with it. But connect it to Jesus and use it for Jesus' glory. And he has been doing that. And uh, God used him to clear the psychiatric ward in Porirua. 90% of the ward was cleared out over wow. a period of about, I don't know, maybe a few years. And there are 21 case histories, and this is about 11 years later. And these people are still off medication, no longer institutionalized. So professors of psychology uh, basically followed him around, uh, interviewed him, and one professor rang him one day and says, would it come quickly? There's a man speaking. He has three voices, and my medicine can't help him. So would laughed. He says, wait till I get there, and you have to sit in and watch me. And so 
what did we read there? And he talked to the demon. Now he uses Māori. He doesn't use Christianese. He doesn't mm. use in the name of Jesus. He just says, Ihi karai tete. No mai haere mai e te wairu a tapu. He calls the Holy Spirit. And he deals with these demons and he helps the people to release forgiveness. And Jesus forgives. Jesus releases them. So so uh, he, he's over in Turangi, him and Lei, his wife. Wow. Uh, so this is stuff happening under the covers mm. in our land that is hidden. Mm. And it's, you know, it's just amazing stuff God is doing in our land at the moment. Mm. So he's one of he's one of our one of our first converts. Wow! And, um, he brought another friend called Zach. Zach was stoned. He thought he's coming to uh, listen to some good music. And he, got to, he said, "This is a church," and we would let him out. So he had to sit at the back, stoned out of his tree, while I'm preaching. And I says, uh, "Who needs to get healed?" And uh, he had he had hurt his back and sharing. So he put his hand up, and God healed him instantly. He fell to the ground. I said, who needs to give their life to Jesus? And his hand went up again, and uh, he comes at the front. He gives his life to Jesus. He goes back to his mate that night and uh, tells him what happened, and his mate had broken his back in two places, playing horse polo uh, eight years previous. So he said, could he come and pray for me? And so Zach said, could I come and pray? I said, yes. Yeah. So we went up, prayed for this guy. God healed him that instantly. Uh, he stopped selling drugs that night. He was a drug dealer. He went and told his uh, brother, who was a Ringatu minister, which is a Maori religion, uh, a bit of Judaism, a bit of uh, 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 Christianity, and a bit of Maori tanga. Uh, the, the, the founder was Te Koti. Mm. And the beautiful people. So this Ringatu minister had broken his back in two places. So the brother, who had also had a broken back, who got healed, uh, asked me if I'd go and pray for his brother, which I did. His name was Reuben. Reuben was instantly healed of his broken of his tailbone. He became, uh, what well, he opened the doors of the Marais for me in the Uruwera, and uh, we saw I don't know just that would drive all the way from Wairua to Gisborne every Sunday just to come to church. Wow! We just saw dozens of people healed, uh, miracles happening, and hundreds of people come to Christ. So that's sort of how the church grew. Mm. Um, people getting saved so so fast that I couldn't teach them the traditional Bible foundations courses because a lot mm. of them are illiterate. Mm. And and it was too sort of academic anyway. Mm. Mm. So I just had to get on my face and just ask God, show me how to show, help disciple these people. You're, you're. Mm. And he gave me just down-to-earth basic stuff about you know, how to deal with the root issues of why they're so violent. And it, some of it is incest. Some of it is abuse, uh, physical abuse, verbal abuse. For some of it is generational stuff. And it was hardcore. I mean, these people were suicidal. Some are ex-murderers. <laughs> some are you know, just ex-gang members. I mean, the president of the Mungo mob was going to kill himself one Sunday. And his mother came home from church. And he said, where you been, mum? She said, I've been to church and you need to come too. She said, I'll come. Next Sunday, he came, got saved. Uh, as a result of his conversion, millions of dollars got saved in our city, and dozens of people you know, got free from, from the murderous stuff that this guy was doing. Unfortunately, wow. he's gone back. He's gone back to the dark, back to the vomit, but nonetheless. So anyway, uh, Television New Zealand heard about us, and they came down and made a documentary called Assignment. Um, and so that gave us more sort of profile of the nation, and so, uh, but I went back to India as well in 96. My interpreter, he died, and his nephew contacted me and said, uncle said to contact you if we needed help. And um, so I've been helping them since 2006. We have 17 churches in India now. Uh, our churches there went from 130, well, our church there went from 130 to 3,007 years. <laughs> And I said, God, why don't you do this in New Zealand with our church? We're not even a thousand. <laughs> so um, and now we're in Pakistan. Uh, I'm, I'm working uh, sort of covertly in Chile with the Mapuche Indian and up in the Torres Straits with the Aboriginal Fano up there. And just wherever indigenous, and God seems to use me a lot more with indigenous mm. than for some reason. And we just share the, about the treaty and about the colonization and about root issues that affect indigenous people and how do we work through that as Christians, as mm. God's people? How do we deal with, how do we find Jesus solutions to today's uh, issues and problems, historical injustices and so forth? So, wow. 
Man, so you have so many crazy stories, and uh, we titled this Walking in the Miraculous, How to Walk in the Miraculous. Is there some things that you can share with everyone listening here? Because you obviously, we believe that everyone can walk in this. Everyone should walk in this. Yeah, for sure. And um, you teach people this everywhere you go. And I'll tell you guys more about the Warrior Activist course. But uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how we have access to this and maybe some some steps or some things that you believe we should I don't know, sure. receive. Yeah. Love to, love to. I mean, freely have received, I freely give. Um, John 14, 12 is my, one of my first memory verses. My, no, my first one was Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created to do good works in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Because mm. after living a colorful life in the world, when I became a Christian, and I'm sitting in a church pew, and I thought, oh, be I. I hope it's better than this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is all it is. I mean, I can't try and be a good person for the rest and you know, for all my years of my life because you know, I love God and I love being in church. And is this is this it? Hmm. Because you know, I'm, my life was I had purpose, and uh, and I got that memory verse and I meditated on it. And God said, "No, I've created you for do to do stuff, hmm. not just to sit in church on a Sunday." Mm. So that sort of activated something in me. I thought, well, what stuff? Mm. So I meditated on John 14, 12. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, if you believe, he that believes in me, the works I did, you will do also greater works. So I put the two works together, that the works I was created to do, obviously, was what Jesus did. Mm. And even more, mm. which is not just preaching, but lifting up the poor, healing the sick, doing the miraculous. So mm. uh, and because it said for believers, he that believes, it wasn't just for, you know, the pastor or the prophet or the evangelist or the apostle. And uh, Mark 12, and my my pastor told me this. He said, Mark 16, 17 says, these signs follow those who believe. And he said, Norm, you're a believer. These signs will follow you. So that's where I got my biblical basis, that this is for anybody and everyone. Mm. So uh, my father, I sort of learned from him. I sort of caught stuff. By osmosis, I just watch how he prayed, and um, but I got to say, when when he would pray and they'd get healed, when I would pray for the first maybe few months, no one got healed. In fact, mm. sometimes it got worse, and so I had this little battle going on in my mind. I thought, why are they not getting healed like my pastor? And he and the, I felt the Lord say, because you don't believe, mm. you don't believe you're anointed. So this is a key that I hope it will help some people. I said, well, how do I believe I'm anointed? I believe what your word says in Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I said, I know that was about you, Jesus. But, but I know you are anointed. But am I as anointed as you? And he says, that word is about you as well. Mm. Luke 4, 18. He said, it's what happens when my spirit comes upon anyone. And so he told me to put my name in Luke 4.18 and Acts 10.38. But first was Luke 4.18. And I had to repeat it, uh, I think it was three times every meal time. <laughs> I had to mm-hmm. speak it over my life. So it went something like this, Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon Norm. God has anointed Norm of Omaru. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that's Acts 10.38. God had, yeah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon Norm. He has anointed Norm to preach the good news to the poor in Omaru, to heal the brokenhearted in Omaru. Mm. He has anointed Norm to open the blind eyes and preach recovery, uh, 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 deliverance to the captives. So I just put my name there and speak it out. Mm. And after about three days, I said to God, I don't believe what I'm saying, actually. Mm. And mm. I lie. And I just lie. And he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Mm. And he says, as you keep speaking this, your faith is you, – you're, you're building your faith to believe truth. Mm. And I, I said, okay. So I kept saying it. I said, but aren't I lying? Because it's not real. I don't feel anointed. And he said from Joel 3, I think, let the weak say they are strong. He said, it's not lying. It's it's agreeing with truth. Mm. The truth is you are anointed, but your old mind's telling you you're not. You're just – but you're a new creation. You need to believe the truth that I have anointed you with my Holy Spirit. Mm. So, oh, okay, good enough. So it went for about a fortnight, and literally, it was like one day, literally, the like, penny dropped. I just, I just knew I was anointed. Wow. And um, I just believed it. It was like faith literally came, and I knew 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am anointed. And when I started praying for the people, then they st- I, that's when I saw the more the miracles just increase, increase, increase. Wow. So that was the key that how did I get anointed? Uh, by speaking it out. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word, and I just spoke it out. Acts 10.38, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. You have anointed Norm to go about North Otago doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil. God is with the Norm. And uh, to this day, I quote scripture all the time. I speak mm. scripture all the time. I prophesy over myself all the time and in my environments and people. Wow. So simple, so powerful, so effective. I love it. So you go around, you're obviously teaching people the Warrior Activist course. You have a lot of testimonials that have come from people now doing what you do. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, yeah. Maybe so, can you share one or two of those? Sure, I can. Um, so what I teach people is not to, let's see, Paul said, imitate me. He was talking you know, to him, imitate me. Um, and, oh, man, Imitate me. Don't imitate me when I'm driving, please. <laughs> I guess in the things that are godly, I tell my church, and the things, when we go through trials, imitate me and Jess. Mm. We don't give up. Mm. We hang in there with Jesus, and by his grace and our weakness, the strength comes through. When mm. it comes about being a godly father, godly mother, parents, you know, imitate us. Mm. So not trying to take on our personality, not trying to be cloned and and, and rob them of their uniqueness and their identity of who God made them to be. But I said, I imitated my pastor and some of the things he did, I would copy him until I found my style. So I tell mm. a warrior activist course, here's some things you can do, copy me until you find your style. Mm. <laughs> and um, so one of the things I teach is called the one step prayer. Mm. And um, so the one step prayer comes from James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Mm. And I figured if Jesus was standing in front of me, four steps away, physically, if I took one step, he's obviously going to he's going to take one step toward me. And um, but I, he said to me, "No, I'll take three steps because I all, I always draw closer to humans than humans draw to me." Wow. In the garden, I said, "Adam, where are you?" He said, I'll, "I will draw because I love men, I love humanity, mm. and if they call on me, I will I'm there like that." Wow. So. So I began to meditate and think, what if I, if I got people to step into the presence of Jesus, mm. if, wherever, anywhere, not just a church of pack and save or anywhere. If his presence is every omnipresent, I want the manifest presence. Mm. And his presence only manifests by faith. Mm. And if I can get people to believe they're going to step into the presence of Jesus, then some, he's going to touch them because he loves people. And um, so I studied the scriptures where Jesus healed. And a lot of times he never said that, he, he never said to them, you're healed. Mm. Like the man with the eyes, with the blind eyes, he didn't say you're healed of blindness. He said, go wash your eyes, mm. the pool of Siloam. And at the moment the water touched his eyes, he could see. And it wasn't the water or the dirt. It was an act of faith. Mm. And Jesus said, faith is an action. Actually, Wigglesworth said that. A faith yeah, is an action. Mm. And um, and then the ten, ten lepers, he didn't say you're healed. He said, go show yourself to the priests. Mm. Do this mm. action. And as they went, the power of God came upon them. So I began mm. to see that faith is an action. And that if I get people to take one step into the presence of Jesus, then his presence is going to touch them. And mm. the Lord says, when you do that, when you step them forward, don't touch them. Don't do your traditional stuff that you've learned. Just let me touch them. Mm. So they'll know without any doubt, it's not my might or power, it's by my spirit. So mm. so I started doing this with people. I've been doing it for decades now. And then I felt the Lord said, you need to teach others how to do this because mm. it's so easy. And I've literally seen people still alive to, from terminal diseases, the, the, you know, stage four cancers, and they're alive and well today simply by this one act. And wow. so... That's one of the things I teach at the Warrior Activist course. It's mm. not the only thing. That's on the second day. The second day is about learning how to activate your faith, how to speak in tongues, how to interpret tongues, how to release the miraculous power of God. It's sort of role play on one another, and God visits these. This, but the first day of Activist course is about unblocking your well. Mm. And so it's about you know, dealing with the issues that still block the past, hindrances, hurts, 
perspectives, church abuse, spiritual abuse, physical abuse, any, anything that, still, that could still hinder the flow out of the valley will flow rivers. Mm. So we deal with that, but it's not, int- it's not sort of uh, psychotherapy. It's not, yeah. We don't share our deepest, darkest secrets with everyone. It's not group therapy. It's mm. one-on-one stuff. You have to go home and work. But I show how I got free from my 13 years of manic depression, how I got free from my hatred, my lust, my violence. And they go home and they got to go through their little journey. And and so the, and, and then there's the other one is how to spend a constructive hour a day in God's supernatural. Mm. So they're the three major things I teach. Wow. That's so cool. Guys, those of you that um, are hearing this and want to go to it, I'm going to put all the dates up in the caption so you can go check them out. There's quite a few that uh, Norm's lined up in the first six months of next year. Sure, yeah. Um, and so you can uh, contact him. We'll put the details and everything there for you. Yeah, there, there is a price to it. Because um, I've been teaching this for decades around the nation, around the world. And, you know, after teaching thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians, I've seen very little fruit. Mm. Very few people apply the stuff that I've taught, mm. and 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 it's, uh, it's I've been going now just over two years doing the warrior activist course, and uh, the, I felt the Lord say to me, um, <laughs> He said a victim menta- or a poverty mentality expects to receive something for nothing and give nothing in return. Mm. And not saying that everyone had a victim mentality or poverty mentality, but He said there's no value on what you're given. There's a lot of value, but when people put no value on it, they won't guard or protect it. Mm. You're not going to guard a $2 watch mm. for the warehouse, whereas you've got a, I don't know, a watch that costs you a 1000 but you'll guard that because it's mm. got more value to it. Mm. And he says people put no value on what they're learning. Mm. Therefore, they don't guard it. They don't protect it. And you know, this is a bit out there because I, I, lo- I love to give. And the Lord said, no, you can't give this. You have to put a price on this. Mm. There's a price on the activist course. It's two days of their life. Mm. <laughs> but he says, the price you've paid for this, and money's nothing to me, mm. I seek first the kingdom. And I've spent tens and tens of thousands traveling the world to some of the great ministries to learn more. Mm. It doesn't mean that it's all to the, the means to the end of being more like Jesus and to mm. be more effective. Mm. So the Lord said, put a price Four hundred dollars mm. on the cost. A person has to pay four hundred dollars. Mm. I will get nobody, Lord, and I'm going to get hit by believers for after the money, loving money. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this isn't yours, he said. This is my gift, mm. and he said you got to look from the resources of heaven, not from the lack of the people. Mm. And he said the only people that will run with what you've got are those who are willing to pay. That money will mean nothing to them. He said mm. if money means a lot to them then the course probably is not for them at this stage. Mm. But uh, they can see the true treasure behind this whole thing. Mm. So I said, how far, how long shall I go? He said, raise a 300 up. Mm. And after 300, I'll give you further instructions. So I've mm. trained 300 have gone through this now. Uh, 37 in the Tory Islands have done it. Mm. There's Aboriginals over in the Tory Island, Aboriginal Fano, And they came up with $400 each per person. And so I want to honor them. I'll never drop the price in New Zealand, the yeah. first world nation, where these of guys course. over there, they came up with it themselves. I want to keep honoring them. I'm honoring God. So there is a price to it. Just yeah. putting it out there, putting it up front, straight up. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's an important subject, and I just want to piggyback on that a little bit, like because I do coaching. I understand this. One of the famous sayings is, if you don't pay, you don't pay attention. You know, And oh. uh, when there's no skin in the game, you just take advantage and – People are happy to be takers. Yeah. And um, it's crazy. Like uh, if you wanted to follow Jesus back in the day, you follow a rabbi. You don't just pay 400 bucks. You give him your life. Like, Come, on. <laughs> Come on. So it costs you nothing to get in the kingdom, but it costs you everything to be a disciple. Sure. But 400 bucks is nothing for what, what's happening. So, yeah, I, I just want to back you on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, man, this is amazing. I would just uh, love before we wrap up. It's already been an hour. It's gone wow, pretty quick. It's flown. Um, to wrap up on, because I can't believe that at one stage you were ashamed or you were worried about being moldy, and now you are mm. strong about that. You know, I would love for you to just share a little bit on what you feel is happening in our nation, what you feel God's doing with the moldy mm. people, and what you see for 2020 as a prophet. <laughs> 2020 vision. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
like I say, when I went to before I went to Gisborne, I knew nothing about the Maori culture. I didn't know to deal, and I still know very little. I didn't know the treaty. So I get to Gisborne. I'm standing on top of the Kaiti Hill, praying over the city. I said, let's take the giants of the land, Lord. And the Spirit of God said, no, we'll take the giants in you first. And I thought that was a devil at the, at the start. But I, I felt like there was uh, blood crying out from the land around Gisborne. And so I followed my nose <laughs> where it was coming from, and it was a monument where Cook landed. I still had no idea, so I had done some research. I went to the library, researched the Cook journals, and about what took place in 1769 when Captain Cook landed. Uh, uh, some of his men shot and killed eight Māori. And the blood I was hearing, the Lord said, is the blood of Te Maru, or the blood of those Māori. He says, this is the first place where Māori and Pākehā met, and it ended in division. But he says, I'm going to bring reconciliation called Tahitanga, and it will start again from this first place, from where the sun rises first. And so I said, so he said, keep researching. So I, one of the stories when Cook arrived was there was a rock in the river, uh, the Turanga River. It's not there anymore, got blown out by the harbour board. But there was a sacred rock uh, to one of the Māori tribes, iwi there. And old Māori warriors swam and stood on the rock, and Cook came over on his yawl, and he got out of his boat, and he stood on the rock, and the two of them came together and did a, a hongi. And as soon as I read that, I saw in my mind the spirit of God, the spirit of reconciliation upon the two races. And I saw Jesus as the rock, and the river is the blessing of God. And that he said that when... Māori and Pākehā stand on the rock, are reconciled through Christ to, to God. Aroha ki te atua, love for God. Then the second part will come, aroha ki te tangata, love for one another, reconciliation, or kotahi mm. And he said, in a nutshell, generally, he said that's his plan for the old te aroha. First, it's that healing with Māori and Pākehā. It's that bicultural unity, and he says, from the bicultural will come the multicultural, which then the river of God's kotahitang will flow from this nation to the troubled nations of the earth. Are we there yet? No. Mm. But we are so much closer than we were when I saw that 28 years ago. And God is doing something in our nation. With yeah, it, It's happening. I don't know when it will be, but all across this land I see Maori and Pākehā Christians coming together, even non-Christians. Mm. I see a bicultural thing happening, and so um, yeah, I, I see nothing but good coming our way if we'll give up our religious trappings and some of our preconceptions and our even our racism that's in churches today. Mm. And instead of moaning and making assumptions about the Treaty of Waitangi, um, study the truth of it. I had to study the Treaty. The Holy Ghost said, how can you be a minister of truth? You don't even know the truth of your own nation. And mm -hmm. I over-spiritualized it. But Lord, there's no the Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female, bond, nor slave. all one in Christ. He says, that's true. You're one in Christ, but I made you different. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand the wounds of your people. And the nation, as a Pakia, you need to understand uh, the wounds of Māori. And as a Māori, you need to know how you handle the wounds of what uh, – crowned and so there's a whole process of, of to work through that stuff god doesn't just wink at injustice i'll close with this in 97 i got taken up into the heavens not to heaven but to the heavens where the satellites are i don't go to heaven every day but it's that this is one of those times when i was in the heavens and the father was sitting on a throne and new zealand was spread out before his feet i just thought of god and nations at my feet it's just beautiful all lit up wow. with glory and gold but there was on the west coast of the North Island a group of Māori walking and dressed in black clothes, like funeral clothes, and smoke was coming off them. As it rose up to the throne of God, I realized the smoke was incense because there were words in the, in the smoke. It says, who will hear our cry for justice? On the other side of the throne of God is the church saying, give us revival, give us revival. And I was one of the ones over that side. So I'm standing observing God. This, this cries of Māori coming up. And then God the Father on the throne turned his ear to the cry of the Māori. And in my mind, I'm thinking, God, are you on the side of the, of the radicals? 
because Ken Mayer was a much of a gardens at the time protesting. But all God said to me, he said, their cry is a just cry. And then I was out of my back, in the back of my body and uh, on the, in my prayer room, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to study the treaty. I says, oh, why? He says, because you're full of your own opinions. <laughs> wow. And you need to study the truth of the history of your nation. And from the truth, I will show you heaven's truth. And so that's been that's been 20, uh, 25 years research and study. And I held that message for 17 years. I wasn't allowed to speak it in the nation. And then in 2013, I spoke for the first time at Manifest Presence. Mm. And, uh, and God says, now the nation's ready, the church is ready, and you're ready. But back then, he said, you weren't ready. The church mm. the church wasn't ready. But this, so that was, you know, that was still way back there. So, and uh, I went to Waitangi this year. I was on a walker in Waitangi. Yeah. The first time I was up at Waitangi on Waitangi Day, it was, uh, I believe, it was symbolic and prophetic for our nation and for the body. Mm. In that walker, there was a first time ever Māori and Pākehā, mm. men and women, mm. children, all Christians, mm. and we're all from different churches, different faiths, but we had to learn all our instructions in Māori. I mean, 80% of us never rode a walker in our life, so we mm. went under the bridge side, but it was freaky. Mm. But at the end of the day, we learned how to all move in unity together as one mind, one heart, one voice. Wow. I felt God say, this is what's coming to our nation. Wow. On Waitangi Day, we were on the grounds, the treaty grounds, and there's all these voices and preachers and all the voices going up to heaven, all these trumpets, but there's no clear sound. And I mm. felt the Holy Spirit said, that's why my people are still confused. There's no clear voice or trumpet. Mm. There's so many opinions. But, but our walker, there's only one voice, mm. and we're just there for Jesus, to honor Jesus, to love him, to love one another, and to walk together. Mm. And we got invited on to Te Marae, onto the, the, the main marae by the elders, the Napui. They wow. invited us on, and um, not on these other tents. And then as our spokeswoman, she got up and spoke and humbled herself. The uh, Napui elder, one of them started weeping. He said, we have been waiting for years for the church to help us. Wow. We have been waiting for years to hear the church support us. So I see what's coming is just beautiful and amazing. Wow. So, yeah. That is awesome. 2020. <laughs> 2020. Man. Well, that's been so epic. I just want to thank you again for your time. Um, you, a lot Joseph. of people have been commenting, been enjoying this. And um, just before we finish, normally I ask people if they can share a wisdom quote or a one-liner or a you know, something that sure. they feel is for the current season? Yep. What would um, be? Yeah. Less hooey hooey, more dewey dewey. <laughs> <laughs> so hooey hooey in Māori is about meeting, about talking and discussing. And, but dewey dewey is it's get out there and do it sometimes. Sometimes you need to meet. Sometimes we have to strategize and plan, I know. But in Mark 16.20, once the disciples had received the instruction, it says they went out and they preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, confirming their word with signs and wonders following. So as they went doing their stuff, God, when they moved, God moved. And I see so many Christians waiting for God to move, but God said, I'm waiting for my people to move. Mm. And when, when I move, God moves through me. If I don't move, he doesn't. So I say, less hooey hooey, more dooey dooey. <laughs> wow, there you go, less hooey hooey. More do we do we? Could I get you to just release a quick blessing as a father of the faith sure. to everyone that's going to listen to this? Sure. Mate kinga hi kura iti a faka ki ki ti kaha me te i o te wairua tapu no mai hari mai o te wairua tapu. May the strength, the power, and the love of the King of Kings, the true King Itanga, I hu kura iti Jesus Christ, strengthen the ears of the hearers. The knees, the arms, lift them up again. Their legs gain strength and courage. Their path becomes secure. I prophesy 
you come back, come back, come back to God. Come back, come back, come back. He he wants to he loves you so much. He wants to give you the ring. He wants to give you the kodawai, the robe. He wants to give you new shoes, the ring, the robe, and the shoes. He wants to bless you this year coming, that you come back and be restored back to that place of intimacy with him. You don't have to do anything. The Father's waiting to lavish it upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow. There you go, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Norm, you can just stay with me for a minute. But everyone else, we're going to say goodbye to you now. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to like and uh, share this with anyone who you think is going to be positively affected. We'll talk to you next time. Catch you later, guys. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Patience means allow it to happen. Stay the same. Stay persistent. Keep going. Faith, know that it can happen at any moment. Get excited because it can happen at any moment. You're so close. Don't quit now. Keep pushing. You got this.